This video was brought to you by The Native Oak and has been sponsored by Surfshark. The formation of troops being one of the principal springs of military science, the strength and reputation of an army depend principally upon the order and discipline of those regiments which compose it. Military organization is a complicated business. Companies, battalions, regiments commanded by men with fancy titles like captain, colonel, and major. Through history, these terms may stay the same, but their meaning and application might vary dramatically. Just because a modern-day company could have so many soldiers and is commanded by such and such rank, doesn't mean that it was anything close to that historically. This series will cover the general organization of British infantry during the American War of Independence. Now note those parameters. I'm afraid that if you want to know about cavalry, well, very little of this will be of interest to you. And if you want to know how the French or the Prussian armies were organized, well, then I'm afraid you're going to have to ask them. While this program will set out the basic format of the British infantry during that war, please let it represent the beginning of your research and not the end. Because you'll find that in war there are always exceptions, and unfortunately for us, all too often in the 18th century, regulations may as well be suggestions. In this episode, we'll be looking at the administrative side of things, that of the regiment. How it was arranged, what made it up, and the function it served within the wider British army. Now these administrative formations are exactly what they sound like. They're levels of the military that didn't serve an express function in combat, but were how the military handled its day-to-day, -day, the basic operations. Uh, clothing and feeding the men, uh, training them, uh, issuing out fatigue duties, and determining the basic structures of rank and unit hierarchy. So we'll start at the top and work our way down. What exactly was a regiment. The regiment is the basic building block of most 18th century armies. There are levels of administration and organization higher than it, of course, but for the most part, the major stuff is taking place at the regimental level. For the private soldier, it was the entity that determined his appearance, his seniority in the army, and his rank. When he enlisted for a soldier, he didn't so much join the army itself uh, to then be deployed wherever he was most needed, he met with a regimental recruiting party and entered into the regiment's service. When he was deployed for foreign service, it was usually alongside the rest of his regiment. So what does this all-important organization look like? Soon after the start of the American War of Independence, a standard regiment of foot, or an infantry regiment, at full strength would have around 540 private soldiers plus drummers and fifers, NCOs, and officers. But we'll talk about the exact numbers of all those later on. There would also be a number of individuals in the regimental staff, such as the surgeon, adjutant, quartermaster, and of course the chaplain, although they're not really going to be in North America. Um, but they're all, you know, they're kind of their own bag, and they warrant their own episode later on. Now most of these men would be divided up, most of the soldiers that is, would be divided up between ten different companies. Eight of them, Eight, yes, are going to be battalion companies, and two of them will be flank companies. But again, we'll discuss the details of those in a bit. And if you're a returning viewer of mine, you probably already have a good sense of the differences there already. There might also be additional companies of men who, while the regiment was deployed, would remain back home for the recruitment and training up of new soldiers. Typically, there's going to be one in England and one in Ireland. That's one of the most important duties of the regiment, is recruitment. Like I said, it was the regiment that would send out their own recruiting parties, and when you enlisted, you're joining up with that particular regiment. In fact, there could be a bit of competition between regiments for different recruiting grounds, those villages, towns, and cities where particular regiments would drum up their volunteers. Once a man did decide to take on soldierly heirs, it was the regiment that would fill out all the appropriate paperwork and administer the oaths of allegiance. It was the regiment, not some obscure government ministry, that would procure their clothing and equipment. The regimental tailor would custom fit their regimental coat. The regimental gunsmith would inscribe their musket, issued from regimental stores, uh, with uh, a number, usually, to identify them uh, and the company to which they were assigned. And if the soldier happened to conduct himself as a scoundrel, uh, perhaps absconding with any of this equipment, well, upon his arrest, he could well face a regimental court-martial. And once everything was all official, as far as his recruitment is concerned, it was the regiment that handled the men's pay, their medical care, and of course, their training and discipline. At least, 
for the most part. There's always exceptions to practically everything I'm gonna say in this video. Now some of this stuff, like the basics of what the uniforms were meant to look like, or how the soldiers would load and fire their muskets, that's all going to be centrally organized by the military, parliament, and the king. But pretty much everything that wasn't explicitly spelled out in documents like the Articles of War, the Royal Clothing Warrant, or the Manual Exercise, would then be up to the individual regiments to figure out themselves. There was an entire genre of military treatises during this time period that could pretty well be described as, uh, as regimental best practice, if you will. Uh, basically, they're recommendations by various officers and military theorists on how a regiment ought to be run. But these weren't legal requirements, they weren't government regulations, they were just suggestions. In fact, the quotes that I started this video with are from two such documents, and you can find them both, along with many others, in the library section of my website, nativeoak.org, if you'd like to see more about just how many of these duties and responsibilities were falling to the regimental level, and some of the myriad of ways in which they may have carried them out. Now, every regiment in the British Army was numbered, and while some of them had names, for example, the 23rd was also called the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, that was more of an exception, not the rule. It was only in 1782 that each regiment was assigned a county base affiliation, and would eventually come to be known more by those geographies than their numbers. Um, and it was only in 1881 that the numbers were gotten rid of entirely, and regiments would just go by their names exactly the same way they do today. And the naming system wasn't the only distinctive factor here. Uh, every regiment is going to have their own distinctive uniform as well. Now, yes, they're all going to share the same basic red coat, of course, uh, but the colors of their facings would vary from regiment to regiment, uh, as would the, the pattern of the lacing on their coats, uh, the style of their buttons, uh, the sort of the, the design of their badges, uh, certain other traditions, like uh, do they wear feathers in their hats, or, or, or even the kinds of swords that their officers would carry. You know, technically, uh, that is a choice by the individual officer. They go out and they, they buy their own swords, at least during this time period. I think that's still the case in a lot of militaries today. Um, but oftentimes uh, they would be required not by the army but by the regiment to purchase the regimental pattern sword. A very good colonel might wish to have his men look very smart on the parade ground and that involves having all your officers with the same kind of sword. Each regiment would also have their own sets of colors, two large flags that would represent the regiment on parade and occasionally in battle, although that was rarely the case during the American War of Independence, and we'll talk about that in the next episode. One of these colors would be the King's Colors. It's easily identifiable as a Union flag, but with a regimental badge or some other sort of honorific laid over top of it. And of course, the other set would be the regimental colors. Uh, this would also feature the regimental badge, but the field of each flag would be a different color and design depending on the regiment to which it belonged. Uh, generally, a yellow-faced regiment would have a yellow flag, a blue-faced blue, and so on and so forth. There might even be variances in drill between these different groups, because like I said, each individual regiment is handling their own drilling. It wasn't supposed to be different necessarily, but no system is ever perfect, and some regiments would absolutely have better officer corps and NCOs than others. Indeed, many officers would even publish books on their own little techniques in drilling and operating for other regiments to then follow. And in order to ensure that their leaders were up to snuff with this stuff, some particularly keen regimental commanders would even establish regimental schools by which older and more educated officers and NCOs might teach their juniors how to read and write in an era when a military academy education was certainly possible, but by no means required. It was seen as important and valuable for especially NCOs to be able to read and write so they can be filling out all these regimental accounts and and orders and whatnot, and of course be reading literature about how to train their men. But going back to these regimental leaders, who were they? Well, on paper, every regiment is commanded by a colonel, uh, but in practice, those colonels often held positions of far greater authority elsewhere in the army, or society at large, but usually in the army, of course. Uh, for example, General Cornwallis also happened to be the colonel of the 33rd Regiment of Foot, and the colonel of the 23rd Foot happened to also be the commander-in-chief, Sir William Howe. 
Having your colonel in such a high up place might, yes, mean greater kickbacks for your regiment, but it also does take those men away from the daily administration. Instead, it usually fell to the lieutenant colonel, technically they're the second in command, to manage the regiment day to day, and then below him would be the major. And these three men represent the regiment's field officers, uh, but we'll talk more about them as well, as I said, in a future episode. Like I said before, during the 18th century, the regiment was the basic building block for the entire British infantry. Between themselves, they were largely independent in both culture and in practice, and highly distinguishable. In fact, the British Army to this day still operates on a regimental system. Its importance has arguably declined since then, as you may expect, but still the existence of regimental societies and funds represents a significant part of UK veterans' care. Uh, parade standards and dress uniforms will still vary between regiments, alongside a slew of other traditions and quirks, even up to rank structures. But this video is focused on the American War of Independence, so for now, let's carry on down the line, right after a message on behalf of our sponsor, of course. The following is a paid advertisement for Surfshark. Come round lads, hear what I've to say. I come to you all on behalf of the good captain, Brandon F., now master and commander of the ship Surfshark. Ooh, I've heard of them. Oh, very exciting. Hey chimp, I mean, VPN Surfshark is a fast vessel, easy to man. She's jam-packed with valuable features, can be run on unlimited devices. Entering into subscription with VPN Surfshark permits its users, I mean, her crew, to virtually travel the world in but an instant, allowing you to connect with such media content as might otherwise be blocked or unavailable to you. What witchcraft would allow us to travel the oceans without risk of disease or storm? Tis not witchcraft, my lad. VPN Surfshark is a fine vessel of the highest capacity. She boasts of a 3200 servers in over 65 different countries. I didn't even know there were that many. And unlike some other ships which watch your every move whilst aboard, Surfshark maintains a strict policy of collecting no logs daily or otherwise and collects none of your data. The good Captain Brandon F also promises minimal floggings. Surfshark automatically blocks over one million known malintent websites, phishing methods, and other threats to your security, while offering 24-7 access to her customer support, I mean her petty officers, for support via live chat, email, or social media. No logs? Isn't that against the Articles of War? What's the difference between email and the post? Shh! All royal tars of old England seeking glory, advancement, and the ability to use public Wi-Fi safely are to repair to the below listed link, where upon the use of code Brandon F, they shall receive a discount equal to 83% off and three extra months free of charge. Guys, I'm starting to think that this guy isn't from the Navy. Captain Brandon F has also requested that I affirm and state with pride that this has been a sponsored message from Surfshark VPN, and that now you might all return to the regular video. I mentioned earlier that every regiment was made up of 10 companies, excluding any additional companies back home in recruiting duty, that is. Before the war, each company would have 36 private men, but this was expanded in November of 1775 to 54 privates, alongside two drummers, three corporals, and three sergeants, for a total of 62 other ranks per company, and usually three officers each. Grenadier companies would also have two fifers. The junior officers in each company would depend on what kind of company they were. Both of the flank companies, the Grenadiers and the Lights, which if you'd like to learn more about what makes those guys so special, I have two videos on exactly that topic, well each of them would be led by a captain with two lieutenants to support him. Meanwhile, the remaining eight companies, called the battalion companies, would also be commanded by a captain, but would only have one lieutenant as second in command, and then also an ensign, the lowest rank of commissioned officer, to assist as needed. Well, that is, with three notable exceptions, of those eight battalion companies, three of them would be field officers' companies. That is to say, rather than being commanded by a captain, they would actually be led by one of the field officers, the colonel, lieutenant colonel, or the major. At least, 
on paper they would be, but again, those individuals are probably out there doing much more important things, meaning that their lieutenants are effectively managing those particular companies. And one of those lieutenants, that of the Colonel's Company, actually had a bit of an elevated title to reflect that added responsibility. He was referred to as a Captain Lieutenant, basically to reflect that despite being a lieutenant, he's functionally acting as a captain. The lieutenants of the lieutenant colonels and majors companies didn't get the same special title, however. Um, I would venture to guess because those field officers were still generally with their regiments, and as such had greater say in the management of their companies than the colonel usually did. Unlike modern militaries, these companies wouldn't be uh, given any sort of alphanumerical designations. Uh, there's no Bravo or Easy company here. Uh, instead, they're going to be named after their commanding officers, either by their name or by their rank or whatever. Um, so a company commanded, for example, by Captain Greygrove, uh, an example from the 23rd foot, actually the first company, quote unquote, that I joined when I became a reenactor, uh, well, they're going to be, you guessed it, Captain Greygrove's company. And when a new batch of recruits joined the regiment, there'd be a variety of different ways that they could be distributed to the different companies. Uh, this is one of those things that's, again, largely decided on by individual regiments, uh, and on which men like Cuthbertson uh, had an awful lot to say. Uh, one of the more common methods was to create a regimental roster uh, by which recruits would be furnished to the different companies in turns to make sure that everyone got their fair share of the fresh blood. And then, of course, sometimes a regimental commander would just have to make a judgment call and assign the men himself. Uh, if one company in particular was really lacking in strength, uh, you know, it might be uh, necessary for, instead of them being evenly distributed, for that company to get more than their usual fair share of recruits. It was also pretty common for companies to exchange men between them for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, for example, if a battalion soldier was uh, proving himself to be particularly competent and had enough experience, well, the light infantry captain may request that he be transferred over into his company. Uh, and then, if the battalion company was really suffering as a result, uh, it may even be necessitated by, again, regimental commanding officers, um, that the weakest man in the lights be transferred over to the battalion company as a, you know, an exchange of soldiers. And contrary to popular thought, technically speaking, the company was not a combat organization. It was purely administrative. During certain drills, inspections, and of course on the parade ground, the men would be marching with their companies as part of the wider regiment. And the makeup of each company was a very carefully curated affair for this reason, with particular attention being paid to the sizing of the men and their location in the formation. It was usually the case that the tallest men would be in the front rank, although that doesn't really work out for combat, and that's neither here nor there. It was all about cutting the best, most professional and soldierly air. Uh, officers and NCOs were all assigned to specific companies, and so the majority of disciplinary actions, uh, formal inspections, housing arrangements, and other things like that, they're all taking place more or less at this level under the auspices of the regiment. However, for those times when practicality took precedence over aesthetic, such as performing fatigue duties, um, and of course, you know, actual fighting, uh, the rigid structure of the company where uh, transferring soldiers between them was a relatively paperwork-heavy affair, uh, requiring the consent of numerous officers along the way and all that kind of thing, uh, well, regularly that more rigid structure is going to be deferring to more adaptable, less formal, and more temporary accommodations, which we'll discuss in the next episode. But for now, there's just one more important level of organization that I'd like to cover in this administrative category. And it is there that we will find a great chunk of this actual administration, rather than regulation, taking place. So if the regiment and the company are issuing most of those orders and setting the regulations in place for how the soldiers are to be managed, at what level is that management actually taking place? Who is putting it all into practice? To understand how the army is functioning at its most basic level, we'll have to talk about the squads of inspection. For this next section, I'm going to be mainly pulling from these bits of Bennett Cuthbertson's System for the Complete Interior Management and Economy of a Battalion of Infantry. My god, they love their long, windy titles in the 18th century. Um, one of, it's one of those uh, non-governmental how-to guides that I mentioned earlier on how to manage a regiment, basically. Uh, so take all this with a little more salt. Don't treat it as like an historical absolute. 
it's more of an ideal system. Basically, the importance and the responsibilities, like the exact details of each squad of inspection, is gonna vary from regiment to regiment, you know, how different officers are applying these systems however they think is best. Uh, this, like the entire video, honestly, is really just a very rough overview. Let it be your introduction to the idea so that you can go off and do further reading. Again, library section on my website might be a good place to start off with that. Start by no means end. With that said, every company would be divided up into a number of squads of inspection that is equal to the number of NCOs in that company. So every sergeant and corporal is gonna have one little group of soldiers where it's his personal responsibility to make sure they're up to snuff. At full strength, although to be honest, a company is rarely if ever going to be actually at full strength, um, that means six squads of around nine men each. Although Cuthbertson says that drummers and fifers ought to be included in these squads as well, ultimately those men would fall under the authority of their respective drum major and fife major, more so than regular old NCOs and officers. Uh, but we can talk more about the regimental music in a future episode, though. In an ideal system, the men wouldn't just be divided at random into squads either, but be carefully selected by the company officers. Cuthbertson recommends that each squad be evenly split between good, sober men alongside those of lesser quality, rather than shoving all of your sour apples into one or two bad batches. This not only alleviates the burden on the individual NCOs who have to deal with all those men, but it also helps to provide each squad with a number of good examples for the other men to follow. This could lead to variances in the exact size of each squad, of course, uh, as the officers are trying to figure out, you know, which men go best with which. Uh, but these are not really very formal arrangements, and you can be making changes to them on the fly uh, pretty easily. You know, it's all at the company level. You're dealing with a couple of dozen men as opposed to an entire regiment or something. There's not going to be as much bureaucratic red tape with all of it as if you were transferring men between companies, for example. Uh, think of these as non-formal arrangements that can be made within an organizational structure, which is then supporting that structure and allowing it to function. Cuthbertson also stresses the importance of each NCO becoming well familiar with the dispositions, the character of the men in their squad, so they know how to best treat them. And as much as possible, tentage and other housing would be arranged to permit these squads staying together, with their NCO always close at hand. Squads of inspection were important for the health of the army. The NCOs are responsible for ensuring that the personal belongings of any man in their squad who might have been injured or fallen ill would be brought to the regimental hospital, and that his arms and accoutrements, you know, his weapons basically, are all going to be returned to the regimental stores. Uh, if that ill soldier is then later discharged from hospital, it's going to be that NCO who's responsible for making sure he's following the medical advice, such as taking his medicine. Uh, they also maintained the regiment's standards of uniformity, of cleanliness, and precision. Uh, before every morning's inspection by the officers, it was the responsibility of squad leaders to look over the men in their squad to ensure their, you know, their belting was properly pipe clayed, uh, their brass is polished, their clothing is clean, and their arms are kept in good working order. And for those men who were new to the art of soldiering, squad leaders would teach them how to properly clean all of their equipment, including how to remove and clean the locks from their musket. Basically, the squad provided every private soldier with his first point of contact in how to do his job. It provided him with good examples to follow and made sure that within these very large army organizations, there was someone there to look after him and his interests. And of course, if a man was ever found to be lacking in his zeal for the service, well, any good officer would immediately know where to find and correct the fault in the man's squad and its leadership. But again, we're talking here more about ideals and preferences, particularly those of Bennett Cuthbertson, rather than official army policy. The words squad and inspection make no appearance in the manual exercise or the articles of war and in many other documents besides. And so the precise duties and qualifications uh, for these groups is probably going, like I said earlier, it's probably going to vary. 
All the same, it was the proud tradition of the British Army that the real nitty-gritty of discipline and training of the men usually came down to the NCOs. Uh, even younger officers, you know, young new ensign, freshly commissioned, uh, new to their duty and without much by way of military education, they're probably going to be learning a great deal of their duty from those same NCOs who were technically under their command. Uh, there are going to be other levels of organization at a similar level, of course, uh, such as messes, uh, those small groupings of men who would draw rations and cook together. It's actually a very common misconception that um, women were doing all the cooking for the army during this time period. Well, no, women have their own jobs, different jobs. Cooking is actually going to be done by the men. They're cooking their own food, preparing their own rations. Um, but expounding further here, I think, is going to be a little repetitive for all that. So just know that it's not like the squad of inspection is literally where all army life is centered around. It's just one of multiple levels. Um, it's just a lot of things serve very similar purposes. Um, as ever, again, I recommend look to the sources yourself, all listed in the description down below. The British Army was very much arranged at a regimental level, where individual regiments of foot maintained distinctive unit cultures and traditions, uh, uniforms, and even, to some extent, administrative structures. These regiments, in turn, were made up of various companies of different kinds of soldiers, led by officers who disseminated orders, inspected the quality of their troops, and assigned the men under their command to smaller squads of inspection under the close management of NCOs. But of course, this is only half of the story, honestly, probably even less than that. Uh, after all, military organization is a complicated business, and the necessities of fatigues, campaigning, and of course, of combat, all demanded a high degree of adaptability. So join me in the next episode, where we'll go in depth on how this regimental structure was divided, subdivided, and amalgamated as necessary whenever the British Army would march to war. Thank you all for watching, particularly to those nobly inclined persons who have entered into the patronage of the Native Oak and made all of this possible. You can see the names of these heroes here. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.